Okay, so the topic for today is going to be, we're going to look at the Maxwell min cut theorem and then uh, begin the study of min cost flows. Um, let me just get a few things set up here. All right, uh, so recall, I'm just sort of, uh, by the way, can everyone see the screen? Everything's visible? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, Recall that this is the you know the primal problem for the the LP for max flow is doing a maximization over the flow going out of S and you have flow conservation constraints and um, the capacity constraints. The dual, which is given over here, the dual was basically having some kind of distance labels. So the Z variables were the distances while the y, u, v were weights. And the dual says the distance from S to itself is zero, the distance to T is one, and you need to set non-negative weights, non-negative weights, so that the distances, so that essentially the z satisfy some kind of distance property. And what we proved last time was that the min of the dual is at most the min st cut, right? And so what we are now going to prove is the famous um, Maxwell min cut theorem that says that actually the min of the dual is the min st cut. And by strong duality, we know that the max flow is equal to the min of the dual and therefore the max flow is equal to the min cut. And so what I'm going to now do is give you a proof of this fact. And there are many proofs and this is an incredibly slick and beautiful proof by Garg, uh, Vazirani, and Yanakakis, uh, which is, you know, it's, uh, this proof is truly a gem that uses duality. Okay, so what's the idea? So recall that what we have is we have these labels this is one and this is zero. And we have Z values for each vertex. So the idea is sort the Z's in increasing order. Increasing order and sort of abusing notation. Relabel vertices accordingly. So what do I mean? I just mean sort all the values and just sort it so that we'll say that one is the vertex of the minimum z value, then you have z2, z3, so on and so forth up to zn. So we're just sorting all the z values. We're just sorting all the z values in increasing order. I'm just for convenience relabeling the vertices according to the sorted order. Okay, so somewhere in this list, S is going to appear. And somewhere later in this list, T is going to appear. Right, and this would be Z of S, which is zero. And this is Z of T, which is one. So let's look at this portion of the Z's, like these Z's over here. Now let us define the following. So define the set RK to basically be just the vertices from 1 up to K for some K in I to J, which is some K in this range. Note that RK is basically like this set of vertices where this is going up to K. So delta RK which is the cut from RK to the rest of world, rest of the world, is an ST cut, right? Because we have defined this, and maybe I should say technically it's it's uh, it's this. Uh, we choose K, you know, going between I and J, and or maybe I should technically choose that, right? So so this is going to be an ST cut. 
If you just choose the first k vertices, where k goes from i to j, you get an st cut. All right. Uh, any questions? All right. Okay. Now what we'll do is we'll do a very clever randomized rounding trick. We will pick the cut or this you can think of the set RK with probability with probability Z of K plus 1 minus Z of K. Now note that both of these are between 0 and 1. Both of these are between 0 and 1 and that's because we sorted these values and moreover this entire quantity is between 0 and 1 because we sorted in increasing order. So we're going to pick a cut uh, with probability zk plus 1 minus zk. All right? Now, all right, let me just move my papers. So here we've picked the cut. Sorry, just a second. We have picked a cut with this probability. So let us compute the expected cut value. So the expected cut value is at least the min cut. Right? And that's obvious because you're picking some cuts. You're picking some ST cuts. Each RK is an ST cut. And so obviously the expected value is going to be at least the minimum value. And the minimum value is at least, so it's the ST min cut. Now let XE be the indicator random variable for E being cut. That just means that XE is equal to 1 if E is cut and 0 otherwise. So the expected cut value is the expectation of the summation over all edges UV of this random variable, which by linearity of expectation, I can do the sum over all edges of the expectation of XUV. And XUV is a Bernoulli. It's just an indicator random variable. And hence, this is just the sum over all, I should say, all arcs UV, which is the probability that UV is cut. Right? And that's, that's, that's what it is. So what is the probability that an edge is going to be cut? All right, so now let's, let, let's recall that you know, we sorted the vertices. We sorted the vertices 1, 2, up to n. And let's just for convenience, let me just, uh, to give this uh, names, let me just say that suppose u was k and v was k prime. That is after the relabeling. Once you relabeled, u was the kth vertex in this order and v was the k prime vertex in this order. So so firstly, observe that, and so this is the edge, we're looking at the edge u going to v or the arc u going to v. So if k was greater than k prime, if k was greater than k prime, then uv is never cut. Right? Because if, um, so let's say if k was greater than k prime, that means that u is here 
and v is there. And this is the edge. So remember, this cut is not cutting the edge uv because we're measuring the cut value from here going outside. Right? I mean, we're taking the st cut. So we're looking at the edges that go from rk to the outside. So if k is greater than k prime, then uv is never cut. So if k is less than k prime, then, so let me now draw the other picture over here. So you have u over here and v over there, which is sort of k and k prime. The probability that you cut is exactly the probability that you chose a threshold in between here. Remember that we are choosing the cut with probability zk plus 1 minus zk. We're choosing it with probability zk. Mi so you could imagine that the probability you chose this, the cut over here, was zk plus 1 minus zk. The probability of choosing it here is zk plus 2 minus zk, so on and so forth. So then, so what this means is that then the probability of cutting uv is zk prime minus zk is at most this. Right? Because it could be that these things are, let's say, anything could have been more than one or anything. But this is at most this quantity. It is at most zk plus 1 minus zk. Now remember, OK, so any questions up to this point? Any questions? OK. How are you going to start bringing rk into this? Uh, sorry, which uh, which is r? There is oh the cut set yeah so I'm picking the cut set with some probability so think of it as you know I have I put everything on the line and then I pick my cut with some probability that gives me rk and now I'm breaking it up to understand for each individual edge what is the probability I cut that edge so I'm using linearity of expectation which is key over here. The key trick over here is to use linearity of expectation to convert the expectation of the cut value into the sum of you know, indicators, sum of expectations of indicators. So think of it as I do a global argument just to try to generate this cut. And then I try to understand it. I do the analysis locally by looking at every single edge and saying, what is the probability I'm going to cut this edge? What's the probability I'm going to cut this edge? So on and so forth. Yeah. Can you explain again about the definition of the ST cut? So an ST cut is any set that contains S and has T outside. Does that make sense? So going back to remember that the cut is basically the edges that go from S to the complement of S, capital S, so some set. And we are trying to argue about an ST cut. An ST cut is a set. So think of it as, so if this is S and this is T, an ST cut is any set that contains S, does not contain T, and the cut value is then, we're looking at the number of edges that are going out and looking at their total value. So why we emphasize on this ST cut? Is it really important? Because we want, to, we want to prove the max flow min cut theorem. The max flow min cut theorem says that the max flow is the min st cut. So we're trying to argue about the min st cut and compare it to the max flow. Okay, I see. Can you define that probability of the set? You have um, zk plus 1 minus um, zk. If like, you expanded that out to the zk prime, um, and, or like the k prime and the k with some of the things like telescope and they eventually cancel out to be the zk prime minus zk exactly that's the, yeah you get this by telescoping okay that, that makes sense yeah 
Okay, so if k if I'm sorry, if k is less than k prime, the probability of cutting the edge u v, where u is at the kth position and v is at the k prime position, is exactly z k prime minus z k. Right, which is again remember k and k prime are the same, so this is just saying that this is the probability of cutting is at most z v minus z u, where you have this edge u v. Now let's go and look at the dual. Because the z's, you know, we're looking at some feasible dual solution. Z v minus z u is at most y u v. Remember, we can rewrite this as z v minus z u is at most y u v. And so what we have here is that this is at most y u v. So indeed, for all edges, now, y u v is non-negative. Hence, for all edges u v, the probability of cutting u v is at most y u v. So, sorry, I, I think I've so the expected cut value, I should say, is CE times XE, right? It's the capacity times that. So it's the probability times CUV. So it's the probability that this is cut times the capacity of this cut, right? because I'm actually looking at the cut value. So it's the summation over all edges of the capacity times this indicator. So the expected cut value is the sum over all uv of the probability that uv is cut times cuv. But we just argue that the probability of cutting uv is at most yuv, which is the dual variable uh, that we have corresponding to each edge. Okay. And so now if you put it together, what you get is that the expected cut value is at most the sum over all edges uv of yuv times cuv. But what is this? This is exactly the dual objective value. That's exactly the objective of the dual. And so when you put this together, this is exactly the dual objective. And so what this means is that the expected va cut value is at most the dual objective, which is, which is essentially the min of the dual. But we've already argued previously that the min of the dual is at most the min ST cut. Right? And this was a fairly simple argument. So the min of the dual is at most the min ST is the is the min st cut. But we also argued that the expected cut value is at least the min st cut. And so what we have here is this is at least the min st cut. And therefore, these are all equal. And therefore, the min of the dual is equal to the min st cut. And this proves the this is a proof of the Maxwell min cut theorem. It's an, it's an absolutely beautiful proof. So basically what it says is you just take the dual optimal solution and then you round it appropriately and you can actually get the cut. Any questions? Any questions about this? So what this proves is the Maxwell min cut theorem. I'll just walk through it, you know, really do sort of a quick run through of, of the proof again. I should have maybe set start with the optimum of the dual, right? So you start with an optimum of the dual. 
So you start with some dual optimum. It gives you some Y's and some Z's. This is the optimum of the dual. You sort all the Z's in increasing order and just relabel the vertices going from 1 to N in this order. You know that somewhere ZS lies and that's 0 and somewhere ZT appears and that is 1. Now you pick a threshold in between these to choose a cut that separates S from T. So you define the set RK where R is the first K vertices and you pick RK with probability ZK plus 1 minus ZK. So when you set this up, you are guaranteed to pick one of these, right? Because ZT minus ZS is 1. So you're going to pick one of these cuts. And we can look at the expected cut value. The expected cut value is at least the ST min cut. And we have an indicator random variable for the edge being cut. The expected cut value is a summation of CE times XE, where XE is the indicator. And we prove that the probability that UV is cut is at most the dual variable YUV. And once you plug all, put it all together, so the expected cut value is at most the min of the dual. But the expected cut value is at least the min cut. And the min of the dual is at most the min cut. So actually, they're all equal. And the min cut, the ST min cut, is the, is the opt of the dual, the dual optimum. And that gives us the famed max flow min cut theorem that proves that the max flow is the min ST cut, which is the min of the dual, which is also the max of the primal. Any questions? OK. I want to just add one more point, which is, so now let's just look at what the dual solution is. The dual solution gives, I should say, A min ST cut. So essentially, Yes are an indicator for a min ST cut. So I'm looking at an optimum. The dual, this is the optimum, right? So I'm just trying to understand what this dual means. So essentially, the YUV is going to be one when it's in the min cut, when it's in a min cut and zero otherwise. What are the Z's going to be? What are the Z's going to be based on this? Any, any thoughts? Would it be which side of the cut you're on? Exactly. So the Z's are the indicator of which side. So ZV is equal to 0 if V is on the S side and if it's 1 if V is on the T side. So the Z's, Z's are the indicator for the, for the vertices on either side. Okay, now let's look at complementary slackness conditions. So let's look at complementary slackness. Now remember, complementary slackness says that if you have an inequality, which is not, if you have a strict inequality in the primal for an optimal solution, so take the optimal solution. If you have a strict inequality, then the dual variable must be zero and vice versa, and vice versa. So let x star and y star be the primal dual opt. So this would be a max flow, and this would be a min cut. And so complementary slackness says that if x 
uv is strictly less than c u v, then y u v is equal to zero. Right? Because it says that if there is some edge where it's not saturating the edge, where it doesn't fill it up, then actually that edge is not in the min cut. Then that edge is not in the min cut. This is equivalent to saying if y u v is not equal to zero, then x u v is equal to c u v. This means if u v is cut, x u v is equal to c u v. I should put stars here. So this is for the optimal solutions. Is in st min cut. I mean, okay, I'm, I'm being a little loose here. I'm assuming that the st min cut is optimal, which is not necessarily the case, is, is unique, but that's not necessarily the case. But the way to think about this really is, I'm going to say this somewhat informally. This means that the optimal flow saturates this edge. So it means, just to put it in words, it says that the max flow saturates the min cut. If you think about it, this makes sense, right? So the max flow actually has value of the min cut. And it's kind of going from the S side to the T side. But it actually will saturate all those edges. It'll actually fill up all those edges. So what this is, is actually a structural property of the min cut. You can also argue that if you look at the flow, like you imagine the flow like a little particle that is actually going to follow the flow from S to T. And you can see that actually what it's going to do is it's only, go th it's only going to the min, it, it will go through the min cut exactly once. And so this is a key property of the max flow and the min cut. The max flow saturates the min cut. Okay, that's what complementary slackness gives you. Any questions? Any questions? So I, this is a good time to ask me any questions about max flow and min cut because I'm going to move on to another topic of min cost flow. All right. Let me now introduce another problem which is a generalization of max flow and tends to actually cover lots of different problems. This is something that I, had, that I had alluded to earlier. This is called the min cost flow. We'll see that this problem actually generates, I'm sorry, generalizes the max flow. And what we will show is how the dual and the primal come together to give polynomial time algorithms for this problem. So in min cost flow, each edge has a capacity, each edge E has a capacity CE, and it has something called a cost. And I'm going to refer to that as a price because you know capacity is C and cost is also C. It has a price you can think of a price per flow of P of E. So every edge has a capacity, but now it also has a price. So you actually have to spend money to send flow on a particular edge. Cost can also be negative, and we'll see why that is, why that is important. So the capacities are non-negative. But the cost is going to be arbitrary. And we'll see why it's useful to consider it arbitrary. 
each vertex comes with a demand or a supply. So each vertex says, I want to get these many units of flow or I want to send these many units of flow. And this demand supply is, we'll refer to that as BV. We'll refer to that as BV, where we'll say that BV is greater than zero if this is a supply and BV is less than zero if it's a demand. So each vertex says, you know, I want to get this much flow or I want to send this much flow. So no vertex is both, both has demands, so like it, it has one or the other. If it has supply, we call it a source. If it has a demand, then we call it a sink. And so the aim is to satisfy all the demands, maintain capacity, maintain capacity, and minimize cost. This is the problem. Let me write out the LP for this problem. So as usual, our variables are, you know, for E equal to UV, you have this sort of X UV. So what we want to do is we want to minimize the total sum of prices over the edges. We want to maintain flow conservation with the demand and supply with the demand and supply at every vertex. So for all vertices V, we'll say the net flow that is going out, so this is U in the out neighborhood of V. So for every vertex in the, um, let me see if I'm doing this. So if you don't mind, what I'm going to do is, and this is just a tech, you know, it just makes it simpler. I'm going to sort of switch the, switch the signs here. Just say that BV is less than zero if it's a supply and BV is greater than zero if it's a demand. I'm just sort of flipping the signs. It doesn't make much of a difference. So what I'm going to say is I look at the net flow that is coming in the net flow that is coming in minus the net flow that is going out and I'll say this has to be exactly whatever the demand is and then I have capacity and what I also have is non-negativity this is the min cost flow problem. Now a special case, a special case, suppose um, for all edges, suppose the capacity was infinite. So in some sense, suppose you didn't have these constraints at all. You can send as much flow, but you still want to minimize the price. This is referred to as a trans-shipment problem. And so let me give you a neat reduction. It says a min cost flow problem can be reduced to a trans shipment problem in linear time. 
It's quite neat. So that way we can actually ignore capacities altogether and only focus on prices. So I'll draw out the proof for you and I'll leave the details as an exercise. So what happens in your min cost flow problem is you have an edge, it has a capacity and it has a price. And you know, it has some demand, BU, B3. I'm going to remove all capacities, make all the capacities infinite, and introduce new sources and sinks. So the way I'm going to set this up is I'm going to say, here's U. I'm going to add these two new vertices. I'm going to add two new vertices for every edge. So here is U and here is V. I'm going to add these edges. So the capacities are all going to be infinite. I'm going to write the price here. The price of these edges is actually zero. But the price on this is going to be the same price as before. The price of this edge is going to be the old price. All other prices are zero. What I simply do is I create a demand for this. The demand is just going to be the capacity of the edge and the supply of this edge is going to be the capacity of this edge. So if this was sending x e units of flow, then the way you set it up is this is now going to send x e units of flow. This is going to send x e units of flow. And this edge over here will send CUV minus X or XU or whatever XE units of flow. And you'll see that the price is going to be exactly the same. So I can convert the transshipment problem, I'm sorry, the convert the min cost flow problem to a transshipment problem in linear time just by adding an extra source and a sink. So this is going to be a source that is pumping in CUV units of flow and I add a new sink that is sort of has a demand of CUV and we can basically set everything up as before. Does this reduction make sense? Any questions? Any questions about this? right so we will focus on transshipment problems I want to show you one other simple reduction just to show you why this is general and why negative costs are useful so I can convert max flow into a min cost flow and I'll say max ST flow into a min cost flow as follows so in my max flow instance I have some S and T you know, with capacities. So I'm going to convert it to a capacitated version, and then the capacitated version can be converted to a transshipment problem, right? So, so let me not do the the full reduction. I just reduce to min cost flow. So I have all of these. I'm going to take my new instance. I'm going to say all prices are the same. All prices. So for all edges E the price is going to be zero, except I'm going to put a new edge that goes back from S to T and have a price here of minus one. And I set all demand supply is zero. So I'm looking for a flow that actually has no demands and supplies. This is also called a circulation. So it's a flow that just kind of goes around. So you can think of it as you have flow conservation constraints on all vertices. But the way that you convert a max flow is you have to ship that flow from T back to S. And every time you ship it back to S, you get minus one cost. 
So you want to ship as much flow as possible from T to S. And that converts the optimum of this max flow problem is exactly the min cost flow. Or technically, I guess it's the negative of that. So when you minimize the cost, the cost is going to be negative, And it's ex going to be exactly the negative of the maxed flow, the optimum solution. Any questions about that? Any questions about this reduction? It's a good time for me to pause. I'll pause the recording and take any questions that you have up to this point. So we've seen that negative costs can reduce max flow to min cost flow. Moreover, a min cost flow problem can be reduced to a transshipment problem. And so our aim is going to be getting algorithms for the transshipment problem. Now the nice thing about the transshipment problem is there is no capacity constraint. So there is only, the only constraint that we have is a non-negativity constraint. And we have conservation constraints at all vertices. So this is very nice for the dual because the dual only needs a variable. It only needs a variable for every vertex. The dual variable, so now let's, we're going to define the dual. I'll write the dual separately. We're going to have a dual variable y, v for every vertex. Right? And that's the dual variable for each flow conservation constraint. So I'm going to write out the dual over here. And we'll come back to referencing it. I'm not going to prove that this is the dual. I'm going to let that be an exercise. So the dual is going to be maximizing the sum of BV, YV. And the constraint that we have is for all essentially edges of arcs uv, yv is less than yu plus the price of uv. So we have a distance label and that's it. Remember that these can be negative. They can be negative. So it's not so trivial that, that such dual variables would even exist. So this is the dual. Okay, first question. Given a min cost flow, or even better, let's take a transshipment instance, we need to ask two questions. Is it feasible to, does an optimum exist? Because it could be that the optimum cost could be minus infinity, who knows, because the prices are negative. So can someone tell me how, how does one determine if it's feasible or not? So you have a transshipment problem. How do you know whether it's feasible? So how do we determine whether it's feasible or not? So let us look at sources, which I'll refer to the set S. And these are all of the ones 
where BV is, uh, I'm sorry, did I, I keep mixing these up, my apologies. So I made that, yeah, so I'm looking over here at V, I'm looking at how much flow is coming in minus how much flow is going out. And if that is negative, means that more flow is going out than coming in, right? Then it's essentially, it's all V such that BV is less than zero. And a sink, which I'll call script T, is all V such that BV is greater than zero. Okay, so I create, I take my graph now. I take S and T. And I do the following. I create this one vertex here, which I'll call little s and little t. Now, each of these is going to have an edge to everything in S. And each thing in script T is going to have an edge to T. The capacities are all just going to be the absolute value of BVs. B, whatever the, you know, I'll say B of little s. Uh, I shouldn't say B of little s. So let's just say this is V. So this is B of V. And if this is some V, then it's some whatever B of V. Right? So for each vertex, I create a new edge that is going to either supply it, its supply, it's going to give its supply or take away its demand. So this is giving supply. And this is taking the demand. All other edges have infinite capacity. Even if they didn't have infinite, even if these were capacitated, it's still fine. If they were capacitated, it's still fine. It doesn't matter what. So for any min cost flow problem, for any min cost flow problem, I just claim that the min cost flow is feasible if and only if the instance above has a max flow of what I'll say B of S, which should be equal to B of T. So I'll just say that B of S is just a summation over all vertices of the absolute value of B of V. Right? So this is like the total supply. And B of T, this is the total demand. So the min cost flow is feasible if and only if the instance that I've drawn above has a max flow of exactly B of S equal to B of T. Okay, this is an exercise. But hopefully you see why it's true, even in the capacitated case, even when you have capacities. It's just a max flow. So to determine feasibility is a max flow. Questions? Does this reduction make sense? All right. So hopefully if, if that is clear, I'm now going to prove a theorem which will hopefully help you get a better understanding of this. It's a very, it's a useful lemma that we, we will use. And I'll just say that the, um, so let me write this out and then we'll see. So I'll say the min cost flow is feasible if and only if the total demand is zero. Or maybe I should, I'll just write this as the total demand is equal to the total supply. And for all, 
for all A, which is in the set, such that the cut value is 0, which means that there are no edges. What does this mean? It means that means that this is the empty set. There are no edges. The total demand of um, of all of these. So you're okay. So I should say that for any set of vertices B of A, I can just look at the sum sum of all the demands and supplies over there. So what this is saying is, suppose you had some graph, and you had some A, so that there was no edge going out, like all the edges were only coming in, then you need P of A to be strictly greater than 0. Right? You need this to be strictly greater than 0. So let me give proof of this. So I claim that the forward direction is easy. That's an exercise. Because if the min cost flow is feasible, then obviously if you have a set that cannot send any flow outside, its total demand has to be greater than zero. Right? There's no way that this set could be sending net flow. It doesn't need to send any flow. The summation of B V must be greater than zero, which means that within it, it's basically more sink than source. This is what it means, right? It means more sink than source. Hi, Professor. I yeah. have questions. Yes. Uh, is that solving the mean cost flow problem equivalent to finding a SD cut that the capacity of this cut equals to the total demand? That is only to determine feasibility. So by feasible, I just mean that, okay, so I'm not solving the problem. Solving would be optimizing. Feasibility is just checking whether the constraints can be satisfied. Oh, I see. Right? It's a much weaker problem. We're just checking, does there even exist a flow that can satisfy the demands? And then we need to see what is the flow that minimizes the cost. But maybe there's no flow that exists. So first we have to check, does a flow exist which can satisfy the demands? And for that, you're right, that it's basically the same as a min cut. So if the capacity for the edges are infinite, is it the same? Let me give you a very simple example. Suppose you had only two vertices. You have an edge going from here to here with capacity that is infinite. But this vertex wants to send flow. Suppose this was little s and this was little t. And this vertex has to send one unit of flow and this vertex has to take away one unit of flow. Then this is infeasible, even though the capacities are infinite. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So it's, you don't know where the sources and sinks are with respect to this graph, even when the capacities are infinite. And as was mentioned before, you can always determine if this is the case by checking if there's simply a path from this vertex to that vertex in the graph. So you can just do it with BFS or DFS. In general, even if you have capacities, you can do it by solving a max flow. In general. Okay, so the forward direction is an exercise. It's an easy exercise because if the flow is feasible, then the set A can only be receiving flow. There's no way it could be sending flow. 
and therefore it must be more sink than source. So now let's look at the opposite direction. So using the above construction, we say the min cost flow is feasible. I should say the min cost flow problem is feasible if and only if the max flow is equal to B of S, right? The max flow in that instance. If and only if the max flow is B of S. And now what we'll show is that the max flow min cut theorem is going to imply that condition over there. So suppose there exists an A subset of V such that delta A is 0 and B of A is strictly less than 0. So that means it is more source than sink. All right, so now I'm going to basically produce a min cut. So I'm going to take my graph here. I'm going to take the graph there. And there is some set A that I have here. There is some set A. So I should say that the min cost flow problem is feasible if and only if the max flow is equal to B of script S and this is equal to the min cut, the min ST cut, right? And this is by the max flow min cut theorem. So we know that the min cut of this graph that I've constructed here is exactly B of S, which means that basically you have to cut all these edges in effect to separate S from T. Now suppose there existed this set A so if the delta A is equal to zero, so all the edges are basically coming in. There's no way the flow can go out. On the other hand, it has more source than sink. Then what we'll argue is that the min cut value is actually going to be strictly less than B of script S and thereby arrive at a contradiction. Okay. So let's do the following. So here is our super source S and T that we constructed. Here is the super source S and T that we constructed. I'm going to delete or cut all edges from S to A complement and all edges from A to T. So now S is going to have edges in here. T is going to have edges like so. This is a valid ST cut. Right, so any edge that was going there, I cut that, and any edge, I cut that. And so the cut value, the cut value is, I cut all the edges going from S to A. Right, so it's, 
I cut all the sources, that, I'm sorry, I cut all the edges going from S to A complement. So I can think of it as I look at all sources that are in A and I cut them plus I look at all the sinks um, am I doing this right no I'm sorry it's the it's the other way around S minus A I'm looking at all the sinks that were in A and I cut those right that's what the cut value that is what the cut value is. Now I can rewrite this as this is just the sum over all the sources, their demand, minus all V in S intersect A of BV plus T intersect A of BV. But remember, B of A was less than zero, which means that this set was more source than sink. So this is, this is just looking at the total B of S. Plus, I'm just going to write this out. I'm going to say this is the the total sink in A minus the total source in A. And this is strictly less than zero because we said that B of A is less than zero. It's more source than there is sink. And hence, the cut value is strictly less in B of S. But that would argue that the cut value, but we know that this is the min ST cut. And so that's a contradiction. And meaning that this condition cannot hold. So what this means is the min cost flow is feasible if and only if, if and only if, for all sets such that there are no edges going out, there's no way things can leave, it has to be more sink than source, which makes a lot of sense. So one direction is easy. The opposite direction is a, tr a little trickier and you have to use this construction and you use max flow min cut. Remember, over here, we're using the max flow min cut theorem. But this characterization is going to be convenient, and we are going to reuse it later when we, when we come up with algorithms for min cost flow. So the min cost flow is feasible if and only if, excuse me, the max flow instance that I've drawn here is feasible. Uh, the max flow over here is exactly his value, the total source which is equal to the total sink. The total demand, which is the total supply. The total demand is the total supply. But another way of looking at it is also with this lemma, which characterizes it quite nicely in terms of sets that have no edges going out. One direction is easy. The other direction is non-trivial and uses the max flow min cut theorem. So in general, stepping back, we can solve the feasibility. Now the question is, does an optimum exist? Why may an optimum not exist? There are negative costs. So maybe the min cost is actually minus infinity. And so what we need to do is we need to characterize when an optimum exists. So towards that, let me now discuss, let me give some sort of idea of how you would get an algorithm for min cost flow. So suppose the min cost or the transshipment
instance is feasible with a flow x. So here's your set and you have some flow, some flow x. How can you update the flow and keep it feasible? So you've already satisfied all the demands and all the supplies. How would you update the flow? Just like you, you remember we had augment, augmenting paths where you updated the flow when you do max flow. In a min cost flow instance, you've already satisfied all the demands. So how would you update the flow? I've given a word, I've mentioned a word before, which is the answer. So think about how, you, how, how would you update the flow? What could you do to make sure that all the so, uh, let me see where is my min cost flow LP. Remember that we, you have already satisfied all the demands and all the supplies. So how would you update the flow to make sure the demands and supplies are still maintained? So this is what I wanted to show. So you already have some X's which are satisfying all the demands and supplies. How do you update? Any thoughts? Seems like you're, if you add flow, wouldn't you be messing up the demands and supplies? Any thoughts or suggestions on how you would update flow? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. So it just remind me of the Ford Focusing, because there you, um, after you augment the path, you create a reverse just right. then, like then the uh, capacity change right. so just remind me of that so it is something like that but think of it as when you're doing Ford Fulkerson you send more flow mm -hmm. here you don't want to send any more flow because you've already satisfied everyone's demands so if you're going to route some flow that increases someone's supply and decreases someone's demand or messes things up, you have to do another piece of flow that sort of cancels that out. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is you update the flow by a circulation. So suppose you find a cycle and you route X units of flow on the cycle. You maintain all conservation constraints, but you may change the cost. Does that make sense? It means that if you find a cycle, a directed cycle, you can actually route flow along a directed cycle. It's like it just starts and comes back to itself. But the costs are going to change because now you're sending different amounts of flow on different edges. So this is, you update flow along a directed cycle. This is also called a die circuit. So you, and you can update flow along collection of die cycles. So this is update flow by a circulation. So you add a circulation and this never changes the demand, never changes flow conservation constraints. Does that make sense? Right? 
right? So you update flow by a circulation. Let me give a simple example to maybe motivate where I'm where I'm getting at. Let me take a simple graph. So I want to send one unit of flow here, which should come out from here. That's This is the supply, that's the demand. Okay. And uh, so capacities are all infinite. All capacities are infinite. So this is a transshipment problem. And let's say the price over here was 2, and the price over here is minus 3. What is the optimum solution? What is the optimum solution? And maybe let, let me make this even more clear, right? What is, what is the flow conservation constraint? So I have the total amount of flow that's going out minus the flow that's coming in. So I have X UV minus, uh, uh, yeah, X UV is equal to X V U plus one, right? That's the conservation here. Total flow going out, that's XUV, is the total flow co go coming in, that's XVU, plus that one unit, which is like its supply. What do I get for the other one? I'll get exactly the same condition, but let me just write it out. So the total flow that is coming in, which is XUV, needs to be the total flow that is going out, plus whatever it, its demand is, which is XVU plus one, right? So this is the constraint. So this is the only constraint that I have. And I have non-negativity. What is the optimum? What is the optimum? as much as possible we want to go round and round as much as possible you want to go round and round why because going around once gives you negative one gives you negative yeah. one so what you could do good so you could route suppose set x u v is equal to k and x v u is k minus one this satisfies flow conservation because you get to route circulations for free, right? You get to route a circulation. I mean, for free, I mean, you can route a circulation. There are no capacities. The cost of this flow is going to be 2 times k minus 3k minus 1, right? So what you get over here is you'll get minus k plus 3. So you just make k go to infinity. And the cost is going to minus infinity. This is, a f this is feasible because there exists a possible way to send flow. This is feasible. But there is no optimum. There is no optimum. Right, there's no optimal solution because you can send make k more and more and this would just decrease the optimum. What, what, what is it about this graph that made you, that gave you this? So what, what did, what, observe, t tell me what is it about this graph that made it have no optimum? Um, the total cost of uh, circulation is negative. The total cost of the circulation was negative. So in general, if you have a cycle 
of negative cost and the original was feasible, then there's no optimum because you can just keep sending circulations on that and maintain all the constraints. Does that make sense? So this is the observation is if G has a negative cost die circuit, then no optimum exists. Which is basically saying that the optimum is minus infinity. This is like saying it's minus infinity. So it doesn't really exist. There's no optimum point. This is the exercise. And as by now you may have guessed in this course, you'll often have these situations where one side is an exercise, where if some condition holds and something else holds, and remarkably it turns out to be equivalent. So the theorem is if the LP is feasible. By LP, I mean the, let's just say for here, the transshipment. You can also do a variant of this for, um, for min cost flow in general, but let's just look at the transshipment problem because I said all capacities are infinite. If LP is feasible, then optimum exists. if and only if G has no negative cost die circuit. So this answers our second question, which is how can you argue that an optimum exists? Okay, now question is how do you find if a graph has a negative cost die circuit? How do you find if a graph has a negative cost die circuit? Or undergraduate algorithms, there are two words I'm looking for from there. How do you know? So this is basically like, seems like a shortest path problem, right? How do you know how can you determine if a graph has a negative cost die circuit? All right, let me hear names of shortest path algorithms. What is a short, give me a shortest path algorithm. Someone, anyone? The sh yeah, the Bellman Ford. So, sorry, I didn't hear that. A shortest path algorithm? Bellman Ford. Bellman Ford. Exactly. Those are the two words I'm looking for. Bellman Ford can determine it has a negative cost die circuit. So it's Bellman Ford. I haven't proven this theorem. I will prove it next time. It, this requires duality. We have to, one has to argue something about the dual. But Bellman Ford can determine that the graph has no ne negative cost die circuit. And so going back to the questions that we started with before, is it feasible? That's a max flow. Does an optimum exist? That's Bellman Ford. And so given a transshipment instance at least, we can answer both of these questions in polynomial time. And indeed, this is going to form the basis of our actual polynomial time algorithm for min cost flow. But using Bellman Ford, you can determine if an optimum exists because of this theorem. And as in the, the, the LP being infeasible, we can do using a max flow. So in the next lecture, I'm going to prove this theorem. And this theorem is basically proven by arguing that the dual is feasible. And once we understand this, we can actually come up with a Ford Fulkerson type augmenting cycle algorithm. It's not an augmenting path, it's an augmenting cycle algorithm, which runs in exponential time, but at least we can have an algorithm, an algorithm that terminates, that solves the transshipment problem, and therefore it solves the min cost flow problem. And then once we have the 
exponential time algorithm, we will have to improve it to get a polynomial time algorithm. So I'll end here and take any questions that you have.